going to know what we're talking about. We're going to have a depth of purpose and sincerity uh, of heart that transcends circumstances, uh, false judgments, persecutions, etc. The day of the friendly, uh, gentle men or gentle woman day is over. We now vitriolic and uh, want to attack what we stand for. And I encourage, because I've seen not just an intellect, not just uh, sincerity, but also courage. Men and women who are willing to take a stand. And uh, also the interaction across uh, um, denominational boundaries that sometimes are almost competitive. And in this case, what's emerged is a fellowship and a uh, uh, camaraderie.
his opening fits nicely with what I have to say to you this morning. This morning I want to talk about risk. And I want to talk about risk as it relates to living a life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You can advance that, please. So Bruce said it, and I'll echo it. The world is changing all around us. The country is changing. The world itself is changing. We're becoming a globalized society. Technology is making the world much smaller. But here in this country, which is where God has placed you right now, this is not Mayberry USA anymore. This is not happy days. Things aren't the way they were even 50 years ago. It seems like our culture, our society is closing in on us. Bruce said, becoming all the more hostile to those of us who seek to live a life of faith. We're becoming a technocratic society, meaning that technology rules just about everything. If we want to communicate, we have to do primarily through a technological medium. Secularism is gaining ground all around us. There's a myth that culture is making progressive steps forward. Maybe it's going backwards, something that the world has already known. And most likely in this country, in the West, we're in a post-Christian era, meaning that Christianity is no longer the dominant culture. And so you find yourselves at the end of this year of discipleship, members of an underclass, members of a subculture, sub-dominant culture, especially here in the West, in fact, in Europe they're already experiencing much more hostility toward the gospel. And the question is, what kind of life of discipleship will you live? Life of security or life of risk? Now, of course, we study Bonhoeffer throughout the year in the curriculum, and I think it's especially evangelicals like to point to Bonhoeffer's cost of discipleship. We like to, to point to him as a figure who gave even his life for the cause of Christ. He becomes a hero of the figure. I think what we fail to do sometimes is to factor in risk. Yes, it cost Bonhoeffer, it cost him his life. But first he had to take a risk. He had to go back to Germany. He had to go into the lion's den. And so the question I'm putting before you this morning is, if you don't take a risk, how can there be a cost? So if your idea of being a disciple is living a very protected and sheltered life, just going to your Bible studies with your own local church and keeping very safe and keeping the culture out, then you're taking no risk. And there is no cost. And there will be no reward. In a book by a Catholic priest named Terry Biddington called Risks uh, Taking Discipleship, he asks this question, how could you be a disciple if the world were not in constant change? What if things were like they were in the 1950s? Would we be taking many risks? Probably not, because Christianity was the dominant subculture. If you go just around this corner to a room that used to be the pastor's study, there's a portrait on the wall and it's an iconic picture of 1950s Protestant America. Daddy's sitting in the living room in his suit, mommy's in her dress, child is playing on the floor with a ball, everybody's happy, and Jesus is floating in the background. Those days. And the culture's changing around us, and the question is, what will we do to us? Will we be proactive or reactive? This is what Bennington calls a risk-shaped challenge of hopeful improvisation, responding to these changes around us in a hopeful and positive way, rather than just decrying all of the sin and all of the despair and all of the secularism and all the hostility around us. Can we take risks in a hopeful and proactive and positive way to make a difference in the world around us? So scripture shows us that God chooses to operate precisely through times of unimagined change and radical novelty, and that life is best understood from the perspective of constant renewal, newness, 
and new birth. So when we see God doing his most mighty acts in scripture, when is it? It's in times of turbulent change. That's precisely when God does something extraordinary. All too often, the church's reaction to change has been to avoid it at all costs. The church is to be true to its calling that it should itself become an agent of freedom and change that the world needs to experience. So instead of us letting the changes around us dictate how we respond, let's respond first. Let's be the proactive, risk-taking change that the world needs to see. So let's look just for a moment at the biblical witness. What if Abraham and Sarah had maintained the status quo? They never had. What if Aaron and Moses maintained the status quo? What if David had not gone out and faced Goliath? What if Jeremiah the prophet had not taken a risk to speak out against the injustices he saw all around him? In fact, Bennington says it this way, the heart of the story of Jeremiah is the showdown between Hananiah, the prophet of the establishment, and Jeremiah, the dangerous outsider. What it comes down to is two versions of reality and two visions of God. What if the apostles had not taken risks? And what if we don't take risks? In another book called The Discipleship Dare, Living Dangerously for God, the author points out a series of defining terms of what discipleship actually is. Discipleship is risky. It's challenging. It's a lifestyle worth dying for. And then discipleship is a dare. It's Jesus daring us to come and follow him. So let's look at a little passage of scripture. When Jesus first calls Simon and Andrew, James and John in Mark's gospel, Mark's gospel is very factual and succinct. And in that gospel, we see just a simple narrative that they left everything, their boats, their nets, their livelihood, and they followed. And we get the impression that somehow it was their own initiative, that they just decided this is a good thing to do. I'm going to leave everything behind and follow this Messiah, this prophet, this rabbi. Nobody in their right mind would do that. Not out of their own volition. So we turn to John's gospel and we see a very different story in the same events. Here, John the Baptist points out two of the disciples, one of whom is Andrew. And they approach him and they say to Jesus, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he replies, Come and see. And they spend the day with him and Andrew. Looks for his brother, Simon Peter, and the following day Jesus finds Philip, who in turn brings him family to see him. Same story, but what we get is a deeper picture. They didn't just decide to leave their nets and follow him. Jesus invited them to come. Come and see. Jesus is calling all of us to take risks. If we think the Christian life is about maintaining comfort, peace, Ability, safety, security, and we've got it all wrong. <clears throat> and of course, the culture is going to close in on us. In fact, folks, if we want to be honest, the decay that we see in the culture around us is not the culture's fault, it's our fault. Nobody can blame but ourselves. If a ragtag group of 12 disciples could dismantle the Roman Empire, what are we? question is, we're willing to take a risk. The real risk is responding to Jesus' invitation. It's not an idea that we cook up and decide to do. So we assume that somehow it's related to our own initiative. It's not. Real risk is responding to the invitation from Jesus. There's a legend in church history about Peter's martyrdom. And the story goes like this. Peter was uh, captured and imprisoned in Rome and he was about to be executed for his faith. And he's miraculously set free and he's fleeing the city. He's running away from Rome. And who 
Who does he encounter on the road but Jesus? And Peter says to Jesus, in Latin, Quo vadis domine? Whither thou goest, Lord? Jesus responds, I go to Rome to be crucified again. Come and follow me. And Peter follows Jesus back to the city where he's crucified upside down. Following Jesus in the midst of turbulent social change is not about trying to get things in society to stay the same or to maintain the status quo or to make us comfortable. It's about responding to Jesus' invitation in spite of all that change. And though it's scary, we follow him. Guess what happens? We become the change agent. Look at Bonhoeffer's life. It was a cause, but there was a risk. He chose to go back to Germany. He chose to hear Jesus calling him back to the place he probably knew. He would die. Discipleship is not just about having our cup of tea and our Bible and our devotional and sitting on the porch and listening to the birds sing. Me and Jesus got it all thing going. Me and Jesus got it all worked out. It's about following him to risky and dangerous places. I promise you, this class, the 30 of you who have gone through this process, will take a risk, and step out, leave your nets, and follow him. You will change the world around you. Oh uh -huh. 
class of 2014 and 15 a charge of sorts. I guess I'm kind of a motivational speaker. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to do this. None of us, Bruce, myself, or Josh, met to talk about the theme of today. Yet somehow they are all in line with one another. Uh, that is not an accident. That was not our intent, but it certainly is God's intent. That the same message be heard and built upon even as we have our time together today. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Uh, the translation that I use, the English Standard Version, says, Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. Josh, Josh referenced the reality that the state of our world cannot be blamed on the world. The state of our culture cannot be blamed on culture. The moral decline of the, world, the people around us cannot be blamed or cast upon them. The moral decline needs to be firmly placed upon the shoulders of us who claim to be followers of Christ who are not proclaiming his name to this culture. And the author of Proverbs, King Solomon, says that where there is no prophetic vision, where there is no people speaking the truth, prophesying the name of God, speaking the word of God, then people will indeed cast off restraint. And here's the thing about casting off restraint. You think you're going to be free by casting off this thing you think is restraining you, but the reality is, is you are more in bondage than you were in the first place. And we see that in our culture. Morally, I just need to be free to do what I want, right? My identity is who I am. It's who I feel I should be. And so we think we need to be free from the identity that we have as image bearers of God. But we become enslaved to our own identities, we think. And so we tirelessly live our lives attempting to build that identity, right? And we never really reach it. It's, con it's a continually frustrating uh, situation that we see our world in, which results in desperation, and we see that as well. So listen, class of 2014 and 15, our second class, uh, a, a wonderful class that we all do not really want to see leave, and so we actually have failed you all. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> you all have failed spiritual formation. That's a bad state to be in. So as we, as we speak to you all this morning, we want to challenge you to understand that discipleship is not an academic process. It is not purely a nose-in-the-book activity. It is certainly a part of it to be remade as you think differently, to live differently as you engage different authors, to be in the Word of God wholeheartedly. That's a part of it. But it has to transition to a life of discipleship. And so I have three things that as I look at Scripture and look at the first disciples, I see them living this way. And this is my challenge for myself. So you guys are just going to hear it. And I pray that it touches your hearts as well. First thing is this. As I look at the, the first disciples, one of the very first things that happened in their life after they spent three years in Jesus, Jesus Christ Fellows Program, because that's really what it was, Three years of Christ, they suddenly became men who testified. Men who spoke. Men who witnessed in the public sector. Men who were vocal about their love for Jesus, their belief in God as creator, and the redemptive act of Christ on the cross. In Acts chapter 20, verse uh, 21, the Apostle Paul is seen testifying. And he's speaking, and people are saying, well, what are you doing? He said, look, I spend myself tirelessly testifying both to Jews and Greeks, and here's what we are to testify to. Too often we say, well, let me tell you my story as our starting point. And that's okay. That's okay. But the reality is it's not about you. It's about God and what he has done to you. So let's start with Jesus Christ in your testimony. And that's what Paul does continuously. He does talk about himself eventually, but he always begins with this reality. He says, I am testifying of repentance towards God, and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Two things. Repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Your testimony, people, fellows, as you leave this place, is not about how, how great your life is right now because of Jesus. Because frankly, it's probably not. You probably have the same pains and struggles as you had previously, yet somehow there's this hope in the midst of it. And you can't put your finger on it, but it's there. And this is what Paul's talking about. Repentance towards God. When you repent towards God, guess what happens to your soul? It is restored. 
Because your identity is now restored as you are remade with God. You are reconnected with your Creator. And our world desperately needs that. And we must tell them to repent. John the Baptist did it. When he came, he said, repent. The Messiah is coming. That was his message, the entirety of his message. And he baptized people. And when he baptized them, he did not say, hey, you come get baptized and everything's going to be great. But he did say, repent, the Lord is coming. The kingdom of God is at hand. And friends, the kingdom of God is at hand this day. And we must speak of the need to repent. And what about faith towards faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? What does that do for our world? What does that do for us? It heals us, doesn't it? Those of you that are Christians and disciples in this room, you know that healing. You know it in your soul. When you have surrendered your life to Christ, when you have repented, and when you have had faith in Christ, there's a healing in your soul that nothing else brought to you in, throughout the entirety of your life. And Christ recognized that. He spoke to people, and he said, your faith has healed you. And that was all in many times in physical healings, but he was really addressing the twofold component of humanity. You've been feel, healed physically, but really the most important component is now you've had the hand of Jesus Christ upon your soul. Our world needs to hear this message, and we must testify. And there are no silent testimonies. I'm sorry. Well, they'll just look at my life and they'll see. Yeah, they'll look at your life and they'll say, you're a very moral person. And there may even be a shadow of a, of a hint towards a greater being. But they won't know. The devil prevents that from happening. We must speak. Be, be very intentional. Be very specific about who it is that has given you life. So the, the disciples, the first disciples, lived lives of testimony. Secondly, they lived lives of exemplification of the new life. They exemplified a newness of life. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the Apostle Paul speaks to this reality, and it's something that many of us kind of, we kind of reinterpret this verse to our own life. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Would we all be in agreement that there is a way that this world lives? I mean, in your workplace, you see it. People have different priorities. They have different desires. Um, and we oftentimes fall prey to that. And what has happened for many, many of us who proclaim faith in Christ is that our lives oftentimes match more of the world's way of living than it does any sort of call that Christ has uttered to us. We have not been transformed. We have been conformed to the pattern of this world. This is a very stunning accusation that I make. But it's one that I think is true because I see it in my own life. If I am not intentionally engaging the Word of God and applying it in every moment of my life, I will naturally drift towards the world. Because it's easier. Right? It is much easier just to surrender to the flesh than it is to discipline yourself to the Spirit. And Christ realized that. Why did He go off on His own with the Father from time to time? The strength in His soul to be sure that he was in the will of God. Why did he wrestle with God in the Garden of Gethsemane? Because he recognized the difficult act of surrender and was seeking strength from the God who called him to that act. You cannot rel relativize the word of God regarding your life. You cannot. Don't try to round the corners off of the commands. You think of Christ, and he had his disciples, and he began to teach them in the Sermon of the Mount on Matthew 5. What did he begin with? The Beatitudes. Basically saying, if you're going to follow me, this is what your life is to look like. Blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the meek, and so on and so forth. And then Christ goes on in the Sermon on the Mount and says, since I have your attention, let me just meddle a little bit. You are, the, you are to be the salt and the light. Oh, and let's talk about your, your purity. Yeah, if you look at a woman... And, and lust after her in your heart, you commit adultery. Let's talk about murder. And he starts to meddle substantially in the lives of people around him. Here's the reality of what he's saying. He, he, he funnels it towards Matthew 5, 48, and he ends this whole segment by saying, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Holiness is the call that we are to exemplify. And the devil right now in your mind says, well, I can't be holy. 
I'm a sinner. Absolutely you are. But this very same spirit that lived within Christ and that raised Christ from the dead, we are told throughout Scripture, is given to us as disciples. We are to push and struggle and fight for holiness as we walk on this earth. We are to identify the sinful components of our life and, and, and pray for God's strength to rid ourselves of those things. Because Jesus is better. Intimacy with our Father is better. The world needs to see the new way of living. And this is what Christ said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, as he talks about being salt and light. The reason that we are called to be different is that the world knows there is a difference. Because the world is exhausted, friends. The world is exhausted of their sin. And the church too often has remained silent and still and pathetic in the way in which we live our faith out. So the fellows class, testify, exemplify, and last but not least, sanctify. Sanctify. Christ has left you in this world for a reason. He did not call you out of it at the moment of salvation. There was not some dramatic chariot that came down and took you to heaven, even though many of us wish that would have happened. When I became a Christian when I was 20 years old, I was walking through campus and I was met by the Spirit of God as I was walking from one class to the next. It was the most strange experience I've ever had in my life. I started weeping and sat down on the curb of my college campus as people were walking by looking at me, thinking that, uh, what's wrong with this guy? Really, everything was being made right at that moment. As I'm sitting on the curb crying, I opened my eyes and I kind of half expected that everything would be different, right? Like in a different location, like Philip, you know, maybe I'd be in Ethiopia now, you know, ministering to people, I don't know. And the reality is when I opened my eyes, everything was the same, the same setting, the same people. I had to go to class, which I actually skipped, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> the reality is, is that God in His sovereign will has redeemed you, given you a beautifully new heart, a new soul, with which you see the same world. And we are to purposefully engage the same world. Certainly with the message of salvation, but certainly with the action towards sanctification. The devil has lied to our world, and the devil uses physical forces to destroy our world. We see that all around us. Case in point, wars, human trafficking, poverty. What else do I have to say? When God created the world, those things were not in place. Sin brought those in there. Sin is constantly attempting to destroy humanity. The devil is constantly playing in the hearts of mankind, tempting us to take advantage of one another and destroy one another. Christianity is responsible. Those who were true disciples of Christ, they are responsible for many of the social improvements in our world. When America was first founded, 122 out of 124 universities were started by Christians. You know why? The Puritans had this act that they got passed through law. It says this, it is called the Old Deluder Satan Act. Yeah, it's for real, look it up. The Old Deluder Satan Act. And their point, the Puritans' point was this, that Satan settles in the heart of men and women who do not know how to read and are not educated. They can't read the word of God, so therefore Satan plays upon their hearts and their ignorance. And so the Puritans said, we need to educate people. And they pushed for this. 122 out of 124 universities were began by Christians to see this become reality. In 17, what was it, 1782, the U.S. Congress budgeted $300,000 to supply the colonies with Bibles. Because there was a sense that we need to be based off of God and His teachings. William Wilberforce, you familiar with that name? Before he got saved, he was a young man who had money, and that's always a dangerous combination. He lived his life pursuing himself and his own pleasures and whatnot, and when he became saved, when the Spirit of God redeemed him and spoke into his heart, he looked at mankind and said, you are equal with me, why am I taking advantage of you? And so he warred against slavery in England. He began to engage politics in such a way that the, the society was remade. In 1832, there was the abolition of slavery. There was no more slavery in England or any of the British colonies. Tremendous change. 
I have a friend, 28 years old, who was a fellow in our first class. He now resides in Libya. Why? I'm sorry, Lebanon. It begins with a no. Lebanon. Why? I knew that wasn't right when I said it. Lebanon. Why? Because last year he heard about Syrian refugees who were being pursued by ISIS and were moving into Lebanon and he thought they needed the gospel. So, he's not with any mission organization. He went to Lebanon on his own, is living on his own with strangers in hostels, and doesn't know Arabic, but he's learning it, and is speaking to the Syrian refugees every single day. I just talked to him on Thursday of this week, and he said he's 10 miles from where there's a battle with ISIS right now. Why? Because his heart is in the by the gospel. And last but not least, many of you met Pastor William, who was here from Togo, a place that was full of poverty and death. And here's a young man, a former Muslim, who with the help of some Christians in America decided to make war on the poverty that was there, the voodoo that was there in that nation of Togo. As a result, 240-some orphans have been sponsored. As a result, there's a school. As a result, there's a church that is filled with 400 people on a Sunday in a, in a room about this size. You think you're hot now? Yeah. <laughs> you know nothing. And as a result, I'm going there this summer, a bunch of us are, to speak some more to Pastor William and the people of that church, but also to train pastors from other villages. This is what the gospel does when we say, I am not meant to simply be comfort comfortable, I'm meant to risk. The early disciples testified, exemplified, and they engaged their world with sanctification. That's what we are to do. Fellows, as you exit this day, you lived a year with your nose in the book, you studied, you prayed, you met together, you did papers, uh, you heard lectures every Saturday or once a month. It is all to transfer to life application. May nothing be the same in the way in which you engage your world. But may everything be different for the glory of our God. Let me pray for us now. So Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the gift of discipleship, the miracle of discipleship, as you call us into relationship. And you call us into a transform, transformed mind and transformed life as we engage our world. So God, even in my own life, I pray right now that you would equip us to testify. Lord, give us boldness to speak. Give us boldness to live. May we exemplify. Lord, may we just find in our hearts and our minds the spot that we are to engage and sanctify. Jesus, you are better. You are beautiful. The call to follow you is a gift. Lord, may we hold on to that gift and let go of everything else that might impede us. Thank you for the newness of life that you have given us. Thank you for grace and mercy. I thank you, Father, for eyes that see the world differently, and I pray for hearts that are remade. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So at this time, we will be, we will be announcing the fellows, and we will be giving the fellows their certificates and their cords, their honor cords. We want them to have a few things to take home with them. And so you have all been, uh, you've received your instructions, so I would like to ask Bruce Beard and Josh Reckert to come on up. And uh, Bruce will read your name, and you'll come up and you'll receive a cord from me, and you will receive your certificate from Josh on this side. And fellows, I would ask that you remain up front as your name is read, that we all might applaud you, right? Because that is what we should do. You know, I might add that uh, as tough as the Christian walk be, one of the great results of a year like this is uh, fellowship and adoption. Sons and daughters and brothers and sisters in Christ. And I can tell you this 10, 15 years from now, that's when we remember how uh, the relationships and the depth of the purpose that comes out of those relationships. And it's far greater than the sacrifice you're calling you. Uh, you're one. We have 22 students, and uh, I'd like to start with Diana Bega.
and J. Bartholomew Jr. Christopher Longar and Sarah Longar are not here. Mary Jo Morris. Emily Cresson. We got married. <laughs> Mary Jo. Daniel 